Hello, everybody, and welcome to the eighth episode of Tell Your Story. I'm Todd Nesloni. I'm an elementary school principal out of Texas, um, and I am thrilled to have another awesome guest on for this episode of Tell Your Story. And my guest this week is the wonderful Lanisha Tab. Now, is it? It's Tab, right? I'm saying it right. Okay, perfect. So, Lanisha, tell everybody who you are. Hi. Um. So yeah, I'm Lanisha Tab, and I am a kindergarten teacher. I live in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I'm a wife and a mom. I have two kids. They are five and two, a little girl and little boy, and I'm excited to be on tonight. Awesome. Well, I got to spend some time with Lanisha at the Get Your t on National Conference in San Diego just a couple weeks ago, and I absolutely loved just, first of all, hearing her speak and seeing what she was talking about and the things. I followed her on Instagram for a little while, um, but then just getting to spend some time with her, I was like, I knew that this had to be the next guest. So I'm thrilled that you're on here, Lanisha. So, um, you know, you have a pretty, pretty big following on Instagram. How did that whole journey for you start with getting from just being a classroom teacher, doing your thing to now having tens of thousands of people follow you on Instagram? Right. I, I have no idea. <laughs> um, it, I mean, because I spent like a lot of time just like you said, just regular teacher um, with a, a decent following. Like I, I had a nice community. Um, and then, I mean, to be, completely honest, the, the conferences, the exposure there is where um, the, the, the numbers have come from most recently. Mm -hmm. um, and then that coupled with this passion that I have for social studies that's sort of taken off. It's sort of the thing that everybody feels like they're missing. And so it's just given me like this really cool platform to be able to talk to people about that. Well, and I love that you mentioned that because that was one of the things that I found so interesting. You know, when you, when you hear teachers sharing all these ideas or these wonderful things, it's always around reading or math or science. And I love that you are so passionate about social studies and the stuff you do is amazing. Have you always been drawn to social studies or was it something you kind of grew into? Nope, not at all. Um, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I think like most people, um, even when I first started presenting this, I had people that came up to me after the sessions and they were like, oh, I was totally going to skip this session because I was like, ew, social studies. And I was like, I know, right? <laughs> um, and it was just one of those things like growing up, I hated it. It was boring. I remember the textbook very vividly um, because I just hated it. No, it was um, honestly, it was it was about two years ago when um election season was going on and it just seemed like the country was kind of like going insane and mm -hmm. um i was just sort of like watching the climate watching things that were happening nationally but then also locally like you know there were just reportings of like things happening at schools and kids like chanting things at each other and saying things that were just like i in, in my this is my 13th year of teaching and i've never experienced anything like that and so that honestly was the catalyst um, for all of this. And so I started thinking about just the necessary, or I'm sorry, the need for social studies, which, you know, it was the platform to teach all of those sorts of things that we're just missing these days. So that's essentially how it happened. Awesome. And so, you know, you kind of ha you found a partner in crime online as well. And I loved following your <laughs> journey this last week where y'all finally got to meet face to face. Um, so tell everybody who I'm talking about and then, and then how all that happened. Absolutely. So her name is Naomi O'Brien. And like I said, I've been, we've been working on this for almost two years now. And um, we met just like on social media, like Facebook, Instagram, like I kind of followed her, she followed back. And then we got into a message thread one day and we were just like regular, just, you know, chit chat friends for like, a, like years really. And then one day during that election season time that I was just talking about, I just reached out and was like, hey, like, I want to do this social studies thing. Will you do it with me? And she was like, yep, <laughs> like, let's do it. And so then from that point, we created um, a year long curriculum together. And then we just met each other last week for the first time. So all of that work has been virtual up until that point. You know, and I love their stories like that because when I tell people like with Adam Welcome for what, who I did Kids Deserve It With and Travis Crowder who I did Sparks in the Dark, like we did all this work together before we ever even met in person, face to face. Oh and it's like when we met, when we finally met face to face, it was like, oh my gosh, I feel like I've known you my whole life, but I'm just now touching you. Yeah. 
Yes. And it's one of those crazy things. I know like my mom would always be freaked out or my wife and they'd be like, you don't even know this person and you're like going to go hang out with them for like several days. <laughs> yeah. We talk all the time. Yes. Yes. Isn't that crazy? And so, yeah, she, and she was just like exactly how I thought she would be because I've spoken to her so many times. So like meeting her in person was like nothing. I mean, it was I amazing. That. I so, love that. I love that. I loved watching your photos of y'all meeting for the first time and everything. It was amazing. Aww. I felt kind of stalkerish, like, hey, I'm, I'm seeing this from behind the scenes. But it was so neat to watch that interaction and be like, this is the power of social media. This is why we always talk about connecting with other educators outside your school or with anybody because you have things like that happen. Yes, that's so cool. So it's been a blessing. <laughs> So you also, I, I love how passionate you get to about talking about really diversity and making sure that's a part of the conversation. Why do you feel like it is so important to continually be talking about that? Well, um, I mean, there's a million reasons. Probably the most important one just comes from my own personal experience. Um, just growing up as a woman, um, a black woman, all of this um, time, I, I can remember being little and never seeing myself in anything. And the reason I know, I, it's one of those things, I don't think I realized that I never saw myself until I saw myself. And then all of a sudden it was like, whoa. And so the example that I always use is, um, it was the, the Olympics when the gymnastics team, when I was little, I was about the same age as them, maybe a little younger. And Dominique Dawes was one of the competitors on the US gymnastics team. And she looked just like me when I was little. And I, all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute, like she's doing that? And like literally like the next day I was like, okay, mom, when do we sign up for gymnastics? Got to get this thing going, going to the Olympics. <laughs> and so, you know, it just every, it, I guess, what I'm saying is thinking back on that and how just the world is set up where whiteness is the default. Every book you read, um, I have a little girl now and things are better now. Like, thank God for Doc McStuffins and things like that. But it's still a thing when she wants to watch a movie on Netflix and I have to scroll through and see if there's any sort of representation. Rarely there is. And if it is, it's probably not great quality. She wants to go shopping for a backpack. We have to see if there's any backpack without um, any sort of a you know diverse character. And so I guess what I'm saying is, it's really important to me to decenter some of that because that's what creates um, this system where it's like that's just the default or that's normal and everything else is diverse or you know what I mean and so if I can expose my students to as many different people and cultures as possible I want that to become the default I don't want them to default to whiteness always I want them to default to oh you know that person could totally be a doctor or that person could totally be a lawyer because I'm showing them doctors and lawyers that don't look um the way they looked when I was growing up right. if that makes sense well and and you do it in such a great way the way you talk about it. and you know being a white male it's mm -hmm. something that you know before I spent time diving into this and really understanding this i took it i took for granted so much of what i grew up with and what i naturally had access to just by being a white male and and when you take the time to talk to people from different backgrounds whether it's different religions different sexual orientations different skin colors any of that you realize that until you get to know people like that and educate yourself over what it truly means, right. then you don't even understand. It's like you don't know what you don't know. And it's like people, I hear people all the time going, well, what's the point of that? Well, why talk about this? And it's like, have you sat down with someone and talked to them? Because when yeah. you do, you gain a whole nother perspective. Absolutely. And just spending that time educating myself, I mean, that's why like it, every presentation I do and things, diversity is part of the conversation. Because I still remember, I, I, I think I, it's so interesting that you say, you know, I never realized I wasn't represented until I saw somebody saw myself in someone because I never had to think that growing up. But I remember reading um, Ada Twist Scientist uh -huh. to one of my fourth grade classes. And it was right when I was really understanding about the importance of introducing diverse literature to my students. And a girl came up to me afterwards and she was like, thank you so much for reading that book. And I said, of course, I love reading to you guys. And she said, no, it was so nice to finally have a story where somebody looked like me. And it was one of those moments that just broke my heart. And I was like, what have I been doing? And I went straight to my bookshelf and I was like, look at all these books. All the characters are either an animal or white. And it was like, I need to take the time. And, and there's so many great organizations out there now to help people find diverse resources. 
Right. Um, and yeah. even Naomi recently shared an image on Instagram mm-hmm. that was so powerful. I was like, Naomi, can I please use this in one of my presentations? Do you know what I'm talking about? Remember the clip art? Yes. So good. Like so that do you want to explain that to our listeners or our viewers? Mm -hmm. So Naomi put, um, I think it was four Mm -hmm. different uh, images. They were the clip art, um, like little kids. And one was, might've been like, um, like a little black boy, a little black girl, maybe like an Asian. I don't remember. They were all diverse. None of them were white. Mm -hmm. And she put it on her Instagram where most of her following is white. Most of all of our followings are white. Um, Well, not all of ours, but like mine and hers, like the majority of our followers are white women. And um, she asked her followers to identify with with one of those. And so, you know, since they probably couldn't, she was like, exactly. Like, that's the point. (laughs) Um, Like, that's how a lot of people live their lives. Like, seeing an entire um, world that's all centered around whiteness, you really can't find yourself. And so it was just a really powerful way to get people to, like, like visualize what that might be feel like for other people. Yeah, because I saw that and I went, oh my gosh, you know, when you always see things like that, there's always a white character somewhere in there. And when I was scrolling through and I saw that and I was like, wow. Yeah. And I really have to think differently about which one I associate with. And then and then she had the whole write up underneath it about how did you struggle with finding someone because they were of different color or really and I was like, oh, this is such a brilliant, easy way just to visualize of of what we do and how we miss that. Absolutely. And and how do you continually bring that into conversation with your little with your little ones that you serve? So it it might sound weird, but I try not to make it a big deal because my goal is to make it the norm. Right. right? So I don't want to pull out a book and be like, here's a book with an Asian character. Here's uh-huh. a book with I like I want it to be just the thing that happens. So they don't even question it. Um, and I do it as much as I can. And it's, it's one of those things where like, if I, I don't think there are enough books to do this, maybe there are, but like, if I only read for an entire year, uh, books that featured uh, kids of color, um, I wouldn't be worried about it too much because I would know throughout the rest of their schooling, more than likely it would go back to the default. Right. Do you know what I mean? So right. it's just one of those things where I just want it to become such a normal, you know, every image that I show, every um, like I was referring earlier to doctors. I don't know, like years ago, if you saw when they did that, um, oh, it was so sad that like test where they put kids at a table and they held up like a, a white man and a black man. Like, who's the boss? And like all the kids, no matter what, always pick the white, you know, that sort of thing. Like I am always trying to fight against that thing, even with my own children. And so just constantly putting things in front of them without making it a big deal. Cause I feel like if you make it a big deal, then that's still technically centering around centering um, this I, this practice around whiteness because it's like okay like I know this is normal to you but like let's look at all these other things I don't want to do that I want to just like constantly expose them to as you know as many diverse or you know as many cultures and people as I can. Well, I think when you do it more organically, then it to them feels normal. Mm-hmm. It doesn't feel like this was my teacher's idea, so that's why we're covering it. It's just like, oh no, people just talk about this and they share this and we read books like this, and it's nothing, nothing new. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know, as as a African American female educator, mm-hmm. what do you feel like are some of the biggest obstacles that you face? Mm-hmm. Um. Honestly, a lot of the things that we just talked about, uh, we I feel like we're just now getting to a place mm-hmm. where a lot of educators are willing to hear that. And even though the Instagram community seems big, it's you know when you put it up against all the teachers that are like in the in the United States, just for example, it's really quite small. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think you can get into this bubble where you feel like your work is being validated or, you know, supported on social media. But then when you step back and you sort of look at the state of things in schools, I think I really struggle with the fact that like on larger scales, things like the, like, you know, uh, incorporating different, you know, cultures and things like that. I don't know that it's, it's happening or that it's even important to some people, Um, you know, because it just, um, 
And, and I think there are a lot of reasons for that. I mean, school is, um, it, it's, it's hard to be a teacher right now. We're under all sorts of pressure. There's testing, there's scores, there's, you know, I get it. And so to throw this in on top of it is a lot. So if you're already dealing with a lot of really difficult things and then somebody tries to add on another layer, it's going to, you know, automatically be met with resistance, I think. And so I think things like that sort of get to me because I spend probably way too much time on my phone feeling like, wow, I'm changing the world. And I think on some level that's happening. But then I get frustrated because I do see a lot of work that still needs to be done. Yeah. You know. So, so raising children in an environment like we're living in today, what kind of steps do you take to making sure you're raising empathetic children who, who just want to go out there and change things like you're trying to? Um, I mean, raising black children is a little bit different, in my opinion, um, because no matter what, they're going to have to deal with the fact that they are um, I mean, they're part of the global majority, but really, you know, in, in our country, especially like they're the minority, they're going to have to figure out how to navigate. You know, if I were raising white children, it would be a little different. Um, I feel like I would have to go out of my way to make sure that they understand that other people, uh, you know, have done things that are important that have contributed to the country. You know, so I just, I guess I feel like it's a, it's a little bit different. So I feel like my job is almost on the other end of that with my own children. Mm -hmm. And I have to constantly build up um, who they are because there's a great chance that they can get out into the world and be, and be told something um, different than, right. you know, so I've got, I've got to do as much as I can on my end to make sure that they are, uh, prepared for that and for this world that they're going to go out into. Wow. You know, and you know, you, you, you have just started presenting, right? It's something that's fairly new to you. Very new. Yes. So did you ever see yourself as somebody, I mean, as educators, we stand in front of kids every day. And for most of us, like, it's no big deal. But the moment sometimes for some of us that we're asked to stand in front of adults, it's like, now I'm scared. <laughs> so yeah. How does it feel now to be somebody out there who's presenting to adults? It feels really good. Um, and so when you were saying, like, did you ever, like, imagine yourself? Quite honestly, I did. But the problem was I didn't know for what. Mm -hmm. And so I used to sort of daydream about doing what I'm doing now. Because um, I have a friend, you know, we kind of joke about it now. And I told her, I was like, you know, I want, I want to go all over the country and I want to work with school districts and I want to do, you know, like really powerful work. And she was like, what? well, you need to get like credentials for that. And then I was like, no, girl, I can do it, you know. And so <laughs> she literally was like, wow, like you're like shut my mouth wide open. Like you're you're doing I'm like, I am. But it's because I have a thing now. Like I have a reason. Whereas before social studies became important to me. I didn't really have like a niche or, you know, anything yeah. to really focus on. So now that I do, I'm like, who can I get to listen to me? Who's get like, I have two sessions at a conference tomorrow. Then uh -huh. Yeah. And so it's just now that I have something to say, I love it. Now, you know, being a African-American woman who is, who is entering the speaking and starting to get out there, have you ever ran into speaking in, I mean, you've spoken in front of hundreds of people before mm -hmm. and have you ever run into that with the, what you're talking about, the diversity and the social studies and covering all these cultures, getting pushback or negativity right away? And, right. and how do you, I don't know if stand up to that's the right word, but how do you handle that kind of things when you run into that? I'm not sure how I would handle it yet because it hasn't happened. I've, I expect it every time. Um, and I've been sort of trying to think through what I would do. Um, but no, so far, but I've, I've, the places that I've presented have been very, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Places where they, people want to be there. So I've right. never had to present to a group of teachers that like were forced to come to a PD or, you know what I mean? Like usually when I speak to people, they're like ready for it or, you know, um, so I, I don't know. I have to answer hypothetically, uh. I don't know what I would do. Pray for him. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I just, because at the end of the day, if nothing else, I could pretty much listen to anybody say anything and take something from it, you know, without being on the, on the defense. And so I do try to preface my work or my sessions with, you know, if there's no discomfort, there's no growth. And right. um, I guess if there's discomfort, like that's the thing that's going to keep you thinking about whatever we talked about past the end of the day. And so I'm okay with a little discomfort. Um, 
you know, and I'm not trying to make anybody angry, but if it gets you thinking because it's a little more uncomfortable, then I'm okay with that. Yeah. True growth doesn't happen until we become a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and then, and you can't have those conversations unless people are willing to get out there and, and push the way that they're thinking. Um, so, so let me, let me see if I can get some advice from you. So for people who may be listening or watching, who may be in the majority of where they are, whether that's in the majority because of their religion, because their skin color, because of their um, male or female, whatever the, if they're in the majority and they want to, make sure to find ways to amplify the voices of those in the minority. What are some of the first steps that people can do to really, to do that in, a, in the right way? Right, um, well, I, I don't think there is a right way. Um, and even if you get somebody that tells you what the right way is, there's gonna be a, an entire group of people that will disagree with you. Mm -hmm. um, but what I would say is like, your job is to always, always listen first, seek to understand, and like, honestly, like fall back. Like I get, I get the amplification part, but I feel like sometimes that like people get even a little too excited about that. Mm -hmm. And if, when that happens, if you really think about it, you're being centered, it, it's, it's back on you again. You know what I mean? Yeah. So now look at me, I'm this social justice warrior and I'm so awesome. But in the attention, this is that this work isn't like fun or cute, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so to get people that are um, excited about, you know, changing the world in that way. Yeah, social justice and, you know, let's fight racism. That's so great. But if you're not like uncomfortable mm -hmm. a little bit, then you probably need to like kind of check that just a little bit and go back to the to the listening part. Um, and so it's, you know, it's one of those things where I don't envy <laughs> Like it, it's it would be so hard to try to figure out how to get into something like this and be supportive because you don't want to offend people, but then you don't want to be. Silent. And then so I understand that. Um, but I, I that would be my biggest piece of advice is just to listen and seek to understand and understand also that in your seeking to understand, you will never understand. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you'll yeah. never get, you know, but you can there's still some room to try, I yeah. guess. Until you are that or until you are living that life, you never really understand what it, completely what never. somebody else has, has been raised with or is going through. But I think that that advice is I think that's just such it's powerful right there what you said, because I love how you said, you know, sometimes if you are the majority and you're trying to amplify the minority, you still inadvertently turn it and make it about you and not necessarily meaning to, but that's what happens. Right. And so I love the idea of just taking that time to listen and that idea of if I'm not a little bit uncomfortable during this conversation, then yeah. maybe I'm not really seeking to understand completely. I'm just seeking to say, hey, I had that conversation. You know, exactly. you know, this is even something recent that I've been talking about amongst my a group of friends, actually, um, a woman named Tamara Russell has been sort of um, saying this sort of thing on on her social media because you know she was starting to realize that it was becoming like sort of a I hate to use the word fad or trend or or anything like that, but um, you know she sort of messaged me and my me, and Naomi and um, she really got to talking about how like how if if people are so comfortable talking about this, then like it could be you know going in the wrong direction. So thank you, Tamara Russell, for that. <laughs> if you're welcome. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm sitting here and I'm just, I'm, I'm a loss for what I want to say next because I'm just, I've, I've never thought of it like that. And I think that's just such a great perspective to have and a great way to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, I think that'll really push some of us that are in majority positions to really think about the words that we're choosing and the ways that we're choosing to get involved and, and really making sure that I don't know, I just can't get past this whole listening constantly, but making sure you're slightly uncomfortable because that's how you know you're trying to change or become more educated. Yeah, and for us, honestly, like the real, like we're, I'm so glad that people in the majority want to jump in and help and support and amplify. But to be honest with you, the most powerful thing, at least for me personally, is when I know people in the majority are collecting their folks, if you will. Well, so what I mean by that is, you know, when you're with your family and somebody says something crazy because there's no people of color anywhere around, who's checking that in that situation? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. the, and that's, that's where I feel like if you have white people that are truly trying to be co-conspirators and do the work and you're doing that side of work, not on social media blasting stuff, but like you're taking care of things like that, 
like that is so much more meaningful and powerful, I think, because that's when the real change, ha- you know, like when it's behind closed doors is when I think a lot of things really change. I love that. Well, Lanisha, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on my Tell Your Story series. I got to say, the reason I wanted you on here is because I just, I feel like you, and and you may not really feel this way, but I feel like you you know your voice and mm-hmm. and you have a passion and it comes through. And when I heard you speak and then got to have some conversations privately with you, it was just, I was in awe of just about how how much you know, I feel like you know who you are and you aren't afraid to be who you are. And I think when we go out there to tell our stories, that's how we have to be. We have to say, this is me and this is who I am and I'm proud of that. And I'm gonna go out there and be my best, as best as I can be. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you everybody who has been listening and watching as well. Make sure you join our Tell Your Story chat on Twitter every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And um, you can check out our next guest that we're going to have next week. So everybody have a great evening. Bye.